Rcast, the official podcast of the Rchain Cooperative. Rchain is a complete concurrent blockchain platform designed for maximum efficiency at minimal computational and environmental costs by utilizing proof of stake. I'm Derek Barris, the director of content for Rchain. We cover a range of topics on this podcast, from the foundations of blockchain in general to the specifics of Rchain, including our foundational language, Rolang as well as issues in calculus, governance, security, and the forthcoming businesses and dApp development on our platform. Please check out rchain.coop to learn more about our platform, as well as information on becoming a co-op member. Today, I think Christian is going to talk to us a little bit about uh, a construction that he's been working on that uh, maybe uh, cleans up some aspects of uh, what Mike and I have been working on at Ladle. Or maybe it's a slightly different direction, but Christian, take it away. You let us know what you're talking about. I guess maybe as a quick reminder of like who I am, if people don't know why I'm here. Mm-hmm. My name is Christian Williams. I'm a PhD student at UC Riverside, uh, studying with John Baez, studying category theory. I got connected to Archain through Baez's previous student, Mike Stay, that Greg has been working with. Uh, I'm very very glad uh, to have been connected with this and uh, very glad to have finally um, made some kind of significant progress, I think. So what I'm going to be talking about today, uh, like Greg was saying, a formalization of uh, this uh, ladle idea that that Greg and Mike have been working on and that Greg has been talking about. Uh, I have some slides here that we'll upload. I'm calling this presentation Predicate Calculus for Rchain. So the main example of the the idea that you can go find online is Greg's paper on uh, namespace logic. As you've probably heard Greg talk about before and explain better, the basic idea is that we want to take the languages that are being used in Rchain and equip them with a notion of a predicate so that we can do higher order reasoning about terms in the language and so that we can form types uh, in the language that are basically just determined by the logical structure of terms. And then we use these types for checking the inputs and outputs of programs uh, on our chain. As you've probably heard Greg talk about before, this is an extremely useful and powerful thing for the R chain system. Basically, we can write these formulae these logical formulae that express conditions uh, on processes or names. For example, we can write this formula called sole access, where if there's some area of the internet or what Greg calls a namespace that you care about, some local community in your network, then you could write this formula that is filtering and only accepting processes that receive on that namespace fee and don't receive on any other namespace. So this would act as a firewall, basically protecting the community, acting as this filter uh, on the boundary of the community that's checking for every process that they're going to interact with, uh, who else is that process interacting with in order to ensure uh, security? I, I just want to add, Christian, that the difference between this and sort of standard firewall technology is that this is a compile time phenomenon. We check this before we ever deploy the process. It's not checked during runtime. Yes, this isn't a very full explanation of the power of namespace logic. So if you wanted to say anything else, no, no, you're, you're doing great. I just, I just wanted to, this is really mainly for the community to, yeah. to understand what makes this special is that m- most firewalls are, are runtime, right? They're, they're checking addresses during execution, which slows down execution. Here, we check it before we ever start running the process. It's, it's happen- it happens at compile time or, or at deployment time or uh, at what I would call service binding time, like connect up two processes that haven't been connected before. I had a question, a comment and question. Comment being, uh, so, so this sole access uh, predicate is basically uh, saying something like, okay, uh, a namespace I can think of as a set of names, and uh, what I want 
to look at is all of the processes that don't receive on any names, or, or sorry, only receive on names that are in this uh, namespace that I'm thinking of. And, you know, so receive on these names or some subset of them and uh, don't receive on any names that are outside of this namespace, right? Yep. Yep, yep. that's it. Okay. Okay. The question that I had is, uh, so how, how like far down does this go? Is this just for top level receives uh, or is this like any receive that can ever manifest in like a continuation? Uh, does it apply to them or is this just like the, the top level stuff? Good question. Greg, do you want to answer that? Well, the way you've written your formula here, it's not recursive. When you put the sole access as a continuation to the receive, then you get a recursive formula and it's, it's you know, all the way down. Yeah. Oh, sure, right. Because then you're saying like not only, you know, I guess not only does this top level receive satisfy that, but also any continuation that comes out of it. Yeah. Well, that's okay. Very insightful question. Ever since I learned about this idea, I have been in love with it. The way I like to explain it to my friends is as like a deeper version of Google because rather than only searching by keywords, you can search by the logical structure of terms. It's a very deep and kind of intrinsic approach to a, to a typing system for the language. Whereas most languages just kind of make up a few base types and then describe some type constructors on them. In this, you're, you're really just using the constructors of the row calculus itself plus the basic constructors of first order logic. And from those, you can create arbitrarily fine-grained logical formulae, just a very natural and powerful typing system on, on the row calculus. So the question has been how to formalize this idea in category theory. Greg has used this word LADL, uh, this acronym standing for logic as a distributive law. Greg and Mike uh, were approaching the problem by modeling the language as one monad and uh, some notion of collection uh, as another monad and, and trying to get the formulas from a distributive law between them. What I'm presenting today is a different approach, one that looks like it will kind of work for free without extra conditions on the language or, or on the kind of logic that we want. There's still definitely some things to be figured out and it's there, there might be some limitations, but today is just about the basic idea. We're going to be talking about algebraic theories. Greg, do you remember the last time uh, we've, we talked about algebraic theories on the, on the podcast? Oh, well, it was a while ago. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely been a while. Yes, it's wor worth reviewing. Yeah. An algebraic theory is a way to abstract some kind of structure that you care about and kind of take it into its um, general abstract form so that you can um, model the theory in different contexts and you can um, recognize when another, when an object in some category has this extra structure that you want to specify. So for example, people care a lot about groups in algebra. You could talk about the theory of a group Something less mathematicians know about, but more category theorists uh, care about, is a monoid. Um, a monoid is just something with a binary operation, you can call it multiplication, and a unit, which is some element, such that the multiplication is associative. Uh, so if you have three things, it doesn't matter the order that you multiply them, so that the multiplication is unital the unit acts as an identity for the operation. This is a very common structure. Uh, for example, the natural numbers is the, is the classic example of a monoid where multiplication would, you could either choose it to be plus or times, and then the, the unit would either be zero or, or one. Actually, so, so the, if, if you don't mind, I want to jump mm -hmm. in and make a, a couple of comments. First of all, in Christian's life, which you can see when the podcast goes up, he's got uh, a couple of nice uh, diagrams, and those diagrams express the uh, associativity constraint and the unital uh, constraint. And these are these are typically kind of coherence conditions that we demand of these algebras to tell us exactly how they play, or or that they play nicely, uh, and that all the operations interact with each other nicely. And it's a very compact, compact and expressive way of, 
of uh, characterizing them, which is why they're so popular in category theory. But the other thing I just wanted to point out is that when, when we're talking specifically about monoids and the natural numbers, this is, there's something magical and mysterious going on. Because when you think about uh, the natural numbers as a monoid under addition, there's the identity, which is zero, and exactly one generator, which is mm -hmm. one. So it's very tiny, tiny construction. When you think about the natural numbers under multiplication, the unit is one, and the generators are infinite. They're, yeah. they're the primes. And so the, the, the relationship between those two monoids has <laughs> been the subject of a lot of deep and profound yeah. number theory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's pretty amazing how the even the highest math is still just thinking about this this difference between plus and times. Yeah, exactly. Algebraic theories are a very nice, compact, uh, elegant way to encapsulate the kind of structures that you care about. The way that we're going to be using them is that we are going to be able to write down the row calculus or the the other languages that are used in our chain as certain kinds of theories. So the ideas that we'll be talking about with this simpler theory will, will carry over. This theory is a category. It has this one object, M, and then all the other objects are just finite products of that object. And that's so that you can talk about in area operations being certain morphisms from M to the N back to M. In this way, we package up the structure as a certain category. And then when we want to model this theory, it's modeled by a functor uh, that preserves the products. So if we model in the category of sets, we carry this abstract M, this kind of ideal uh, abstract monoid, to a real monoid, which is some specific set in the category of sets. And then you carry the multiplication over to a function from that set squared to itself, and same for the uh, the unit is going to pick out an actual element of the set. We get this duality between the syntax provided by the theory and then the semantics provided by the models. In all of these contexts, I see product preserving uh, as like a really important property. And I guess I'm not 100% sure I understand why that is and just wanted to kind of hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, so the idea is that algebra and these kind of structures that we care about are really just specified by operations and equations. The only kind of structure that you need to specify uh, operations is products, because an operation takes in like two things from your monoid and gives you one thing in your monoid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, yeah. that's all that we need to preserve. So are, are you using okay. algebraic theories synonymously with uh, Levere theories? Yeah. Because once you start talking about multi-sorted Levier theories, they're, they're basically just categories with finite products. Okay. What we're going to be doing with these theories is thinking about certain trees of operations inside of them. And these trees are going to correspond to constructors for the formulae uh, or these, these predicates on the theory of a monoid. There's a concept called a sieve in category theory. It's some class of morphisms into an object such that it's closed under pre-composition. Uh, so for example, if we pick our operation M, the multiplication, and then we say, just give me all, all morphisms, all operations that end in this multiplication. They factor through this multiplication, then what you're really specifying there is some sort of predicate that is like M of blank blank. So give me anything that is the multiplication of two things. Uh, it's really simple, but we can, we can view it as a constructor for predicates. Uh, so for example, uh, in the row calculus, we could think of the par as the multiplication and we could say, give me everything that is the parallel of two things. It's not an extremely useful predicate in and of itself, but you can make useful predicates from it as a constructor. Uh, just to skip ahead, the, the one that we're going to be caring about is prime. This is an example of a, of a predicate 
on monoids that you would care about. Give me all elements that are not the identity, not the unit, and not the multiplication, not the product of two things that are not the unit. That's what it means to be prime. And we would like a framework in which we can specify this predicate and actually extract the prime elements of a monoid. So the way that we're getting these constructors is through these things called sieves. Uh, let me just pause and see if this part makes sense. Yes, I mean, for, for me, it's, it's, it's quite clear. The, the, the intuition I use is sort of the, the old style construction in sort of, you know, standard undergraduate or first year graduate mathematics where you lift an operation pointwise. So if you have an operation like a multiplication defined on a monoid, you can lift it to a multiplication defined on subsets of the monoid uh, by, by doing it pointwise. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's a good way to say it. So, okay. So I, I understand kind of the idea that you're describing. I, I'm not really sure I understand the, the connection of this sieve object to the idea you're describing. I probably should have drawn this out a little more explicitly. What we're specifying when I draw this tree of operations, all operations that end in M, what we're getting is the set of all operations such that they are of the form M of two other operations. Yeah, yeah. Because you have something going into M that factors as something into M squared and then M. Yeah, yeah. by that multiplication operation, right? Yeah. So the things in this, in this sieve are everything of the form M of something times something else. Mm -hmm. so, so this will give you what I call the spatial connectives. It will give you all the predicates that are associated with term constructors. What it won't give you is um, logical predicates like and or not or implication. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, no like modalities or anything like that. Not yet, not yet. Not yet, okay, cool. I, I think I'm on the same page then. Cool. The way that we're getting logic into the mix is through this important equivalence. There's an equivalence between these sieves and sub functors of a certain special functor. If we think about theory, uh, like our theory of blank comma M, uh, where I'm using this, this notation to mean like the HOM, the thing that gives you HOM sets. Sure. This is a functor that takes in M to the N, it, it's some other object in, in your theory, and gives you the set of all n area operations. So this would be like the true in namespace logic. It would give you all, uh, just all operations, accepting anything. And the idea is that what we're really caring about is the lattice of subfunctors of this functor. Weird words that uh, most people don't think about very much. The way to picture this is that a subfunctor is just like a subset, except on the level of functors. So this means for every n, you're getting a subset of the n area operations. Uh, in a functorial way. So it's just saying this tree of operations that you were uh, that you were picking out For each n it was picking out a subset of the n area operations that satisfied that formula So you took all of the n area ones and you checked okay, which ones are of the form m of something times something so what we're really thinking about is this structure this lattice of subfunctors of this universal one that's like just picking out all in area operations. Yeah, so you're saying that it's a sub functor because that last or like most top level operation has to be the multiplication like in this particular example, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. But, but in general, that last operation or top most operation could literally be any operation from your, your theory. Yes. Okay. This lattice is where we get the operations of first order logic. Uh, maybe I should ask you a question here then. Why are you emphasizing the lattice structure? Mainly because it's a shorter word than hating algebra. 
Okay. Um, but it just means we're gonna have we're gonna have intersections, unions, yeah, right, and then we're gonna have top and bottom. So right, the universal right. one uh, that gives all in area operations, and then the empty one that's just always mm -hmm. empty. Mm -hmm. And then we also have implication, uh, which is a really useful one. It's the partial order version of being Cartesian closed. It's like a proposition. If we were thinking of these subfunctors as uh, as propositions, then forming the implication would be forming the implication of propositions. Okay, and and that corresponds to some kind of subset relation. You said something like a like a poset, right? Yeah. So the uh, actual like poset structure, like when you mm -hmm. say that P is less than or equal to the universal pre-sheaf, for example. You're saying P is a subfunctor of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. If you think about the power set of a set, instead of all subsets, mm -hmm. this forms a nice lattice structure. It's a Boolean algebra, and and people would tend to draw it similar to how it's being drawn here, where the arrows mean inclusion. Yeah. Oh, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. But that, that's yeah. because you're taking sets of operations. If you were yeah. taking some other kind of gadget of operations, like a, a list of operations, you mm. might have something different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so you nat naturally have that extension of subset notion, I guess, to subfunctor, you're saying, because you're taking a set structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so we're, we're inheriting these nice operations from the category of sets, basically. Mm -hmm. Right yeah. now, the place where this this structure is living is that all of these things are functors from theory op, they're contravariant, to set. Uh, so these are called pre-sheaves on our theory. Anytime you take pre-sheaves on a category, it forms this nice category called a topos, which has this rich internal logic. And that's what we're utilizing here. This theory blank M, the universal pre-sheaf, has this lattice of subfunctors, and we're we're using its its logical structure. So, for example, here, if we want to think about prime, so being prime means that you're not the unit and you're not the product of two non-units. So, for that first part, not being the unit, you think about this same example with multiplication, but you think about the sieve generated by the unit operation going from one to m. You say, give me all operations that end in the unit. That corresponds to one of these subfunctors. And then we can use this negation, where here we define it to, to be implying the empty pre-sheaf, like implying contradiction. That negation gives you another subfunctor somewhere else on the lattice. To form the other one, you notice that here, this part of the formula is a little bit different because we're also going to want to lift the operations of the theory to act on these predicates themselves. What we want a full predicate calculus where we can not only do logical operations on the predicates, but we can actually still do the algebraic operations that we had in our theory. So this is kind of that pointwise multiplication that Greg was talking about. If we have some multiplication on elements, there's a natural way to lift it to subsets by defining it pointwise. So that's kind of the last piece of uh, the puzzle that we, that we need to specify. But once we have that, we take the intersection of these two um, subfunctors. We get a certain functor where you plug in n, and it gives you precisely the in-area operations that fall under this definition of prime. So when you plug in one, you would get the prime elements uh, of your theory. I mean, I, I like this construction a lot. I, the, one, the one point is that, that I keep coming home is, is that there's, there's this um, modularity to the construction, which is the thing that I'm looking for, where the, the source of the predicates for the, the spatial predicates is distinct from the source of the logical predicates. Yes, and we we want we want to be able to vary those uh, independently in some sense. Uh, 
I'd, I'd very much like to be able to, to, to take a look at what would happen if instead of taking a set of operations, we take some other kind of gadget, like a tree or a graph or, or a list or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kind of the last piece of the puzzle to specify the predicate prime is uh, talking about what it means to lift the operations of your theory to act on our predicates. One thing that I forgot to say earlier is the thing that we're really always using here is the correspondence between a predicate, like x is greater than 3, and the set of terms that satisfies the predicate, all numbers that are greater than 3. So here, um, we're kind of implicitly going back and forth between those things. So here, we're thinking of our predicates as the subset of terms that satisfies them. And uh, like Greg was saying, if you have a multiplication on your monoid, and you have two subsets of your monoid, there's a natural way to take the quote-unquote product of them, where you just take the product of the subsets, you take all possible pairs of something in your subset A and something in your subset B, and then you just multiply all of those pairs. So you get all things of the form little a times little b, and in this way, you're lifting m your multiplication to, uh, to your subsets. Everything that I just said in the case of subsets extends to this, this framework of, of subfunctors. It's all the same idea. So now we can actually make sense of this prime predicate. We can take the, uh, the subfunctor corresponding to the unit, negate it, and then take the intersection with the negation of the lifted multiplication of the two non-units. And the funny thing is, when you do this in the theory of a monoid, uh, it's actually empty. And that's not a problem. The, the thing that's going on is that there are no elements in the theory of a monoid besides the identity. So when you try to say not the identity and you work out what that means, every operation, if you just like load in n copies of the identity into it, it's equivalent to the identity. So there's nothing that can really escape the identity. So it's only when you actually get to like models of your theory that you get non-identity elements and then you get the actual prime elements. Another way to approach it and would be to go ahead and put in your generators. So if you have operations like from mm -hmm. one to the, the, generate, the generator class, that, that would do the trick. Yeah, so like that's why it's not going to be a problem for the row calculus, because there are plenty of processes that are not the null process without having to go to the models. And yeah, this is just talking about like for this more general theory about this just being, being a useful thing to do in general, there is a way to like transfer your predicates in your theory to predicates on the models, and then you can get the actual prime elements. The reason why we would care about primeness in our chain is if you think about your unit being the null process and your, and your multiplication being the par, then uh, when we say all processes that are not the null process and they're not the parallel of two non-null processes, then you're specifying all single-threaded processes that are not the parallel of, of two things. And this is a very important uh, set of processes to get a hold of because they're kind of the building blocks uh, of, of the other processes. Every time you want to think about race conditions or the complexities involved in, in the parallel terms, uh, you start from getting a hold of these building blocks and then building them up one by one and checking for, for those kind of race conditions. These predicates that we've been talking about can be applied to the theory of the row calculus and space calculus and the other kinds of languages that we'll be using in our chain. So this paper called Namespace Logic that I highly recommend everyone look at will be implemented through the framework that we've been describing. There's a little bit of subtlety here, which is you're not talking about binding operators. So you've got, you've got the reflection and the reification, but you don't have 
um, the modal operators that would address binding. Do you mean the mu? No, no um, mu is for, uh, for fixed point. You can easily get those in this construction. It's the after this action, there's a substitution. Yeah, I, I, was, I wasn't planning on getting too much into this, but the framework that I'm going forward with right now is um, Marcello Fiore's second order algebraic theories. And the basic idea is instead of just thinking about categories with finite products, your generator objects, you specify that they are exponentiable objects so that you have evaluation maps that do substitution. And then we can specify in this lower left, we can specify the input operation as being of the form n times this exponential p to the n, uh, which means processes with a uh, free variable of, of sort name. When it comes to defining the communication, uh, it's a certain commutative diagram that uses the evaluation that comes built in from specifying that n was an exponential object. I can attach the, that second order algebraic theories paper to the, uh, to the blog if people want to look at it. But this is the way it's looking like we're going to uh, have a theory of the row calculus. That, that's awesome. Well, that would mean then that we should be able to, within, the, within that basic framework, implement, you know, I build a notion of freshness around the observation that uh, a process cannot contain a name that contains the quote of the process because of the way the grammar works. Yeah. Right. And so from that observation, it's easy to build names that are fresh relative to the names in a given process. Mm -hmm. And so you should be able to then um, completely lift that construction up to the predicate level. And so we should be able to give a predicate for freshness, which is deeper uh, in some sense than the c freshness construction that we get in nominal, in nominal constructions, right? Because for them, it's a built-in idea. Yeah, yeah, right? exactly. Whereas here, it, it derives from the structure. Yeah. Right? So, so that actually would be quite, quite lovely to have both, you know, both, you know, here, here's, here's, the, here's the essence of freshness, which is that, uh, you know, process cannot contain a name that contains the quote of the process. And, and then build, build the, a predicate for that and then build up a, a more generic predicate for freshness. That, yeah. that to me feels like a, a, a very pleasant construction. Yeah, that sounds nice. So does a predicate for freshness have any relation to uh, like the hidden name predicate in uh, Kairos' work? Yes, exactly. That, that, that's exactly right. But, but for Kairos, okay. right, that, that's a primitive. I see. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas for us, we get to build it out of uh, smaller parts. Oh yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Exactly. We explain more phenomena. Yeah. Yeah. He has to, he has to assume certain phenomena, and we explain it. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. The more I've been thinking about this the past few weeks, uh, just the more excited I get because laying out the framework clarifies like what can and cannot be said. And it's turning out that you can say a lot more in this than I would have guessed. And so, for example, if we think about this input operation, in the original example, we were thinking about input on some name space, input on some predicate, and then do some process. And so here, if you lift this operation to predicates, that corresponds to restricting that first n to some predicate you're listening on a certain namespace. You could also do it on this p to the n. So you could um, only accept, rather than just accepting anything coming down the pipe, you can only accept things that fit a certain predicate. Yes. <laughs> yeah. F filtration systems, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, so, and we, which goes along with uh, pattern matching. Yeah, so that, that just seems uh, really powerful. Is that like the, uh, the deeper Google search that we've talked about? 
Uh, no, so the, so the deeper Google, yes. so, so that you're, uh, the, uh, the deeper Google search is one level up. So the, the way in which I'm, I'm talking about um, generalizing Google is um, not at the level of a specific model, but, but at the level of just being able to search for code on the basis of its structure and its behavior. It doesn't matter whether the code is row calculus or Rust or JavaScript, right? Right now, the only way to search for code is either through metadata or social. I know a developer who knows a developer. Yeah. That's just not really sustainable. Uh, as, as the amount of code grows, our capacity to hold in, in mind what that code is, is limited. So, but what this does is it gives us the ability to maintain much larger code bases because we can now ser search on the basis of what the code does and, and, um, and how, it, how it behaves. Yeah. And, yeah. and I was thinking recently, like not only could you, could you view this as a powerful query, but could you also be viewing this as lifting the whole row calculus to the level of predicates to be like this second order version of the yes. row calculus where yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have a term that's like receive, I mean, you, you, take, you take this first term and rather than just viewing it as denoting a set of processes that satisfies it, you view it as a term in itself yes. that can communicate with a huge set of, of processes. That's exactly right. So, so, so now what you're doing is you're, like I'm sure you guys are familiar with logic programming, right? So, so now we're lifting the idea of logic programming off of the, the logic that's associated with the, you know, simply type lambda calculus to any logic that's associated with some particular rewrite system. And the, and the reason that's interesting is because we want to be able to program at the ensemble level. Yeah. Right? Uh, like if you think about programming biological systems, you don't tell them what to do. Or you throw in a bunch of entities and they, and because of their particular characteristics, they self-organize. Mm -hmm. The way in which they self-organize satisfies certain criteria. And how do you express those criteria? Well, at the formula level. So, yeah. so the formula level allows us to do ensemble-based programming, which is what I think we have to do if we're going to program either at the biological scale or even at the much smaller internet scale. Yeah. It just seems so powerful. Yes, exactly. And, and you know, this is, this, this is the es essence of realizability, right? Your realizability is, is demanding that our predicates, the meaning of our predicates is a bunch of programs. Right. As long as we start thinking about our predicates as characteristics for, um, you know, allowing uh, agents to self-organize and self-assemble, then we can use it as a as this higher order programming model. Yeah. Uh, I honestly, I just like hearing you guys talk about this stuff because uh, I, I I agree this is all really cool and and I guess my my thought and maybe this is just like a naive thought is why hasn't this been done already. In some sense, I'm following a thread that is many decades old. Abramsky uh, came up with this domain theory and logical form in which mm -hmm. you could generate a logic from a domain theoretic specification of a model of computation. Mm -hmm. But it was very, very restricted in the sense that he was, he was basically only considering models of computation that were uh, essentially like the lambda calculus. Mm, okay. um, right, and uh, which, is, which is fine, except that most computation, if you, if, you, if you take into account the natural world, most computational systems are, are, are uh, concurrent. That, that's too restricted a class of, of notions of computation to be practical uh, in right. any realistic setting. Certainly, by the time you get to programming the internet, it's got to be concurrent. There's just no way around it. Yeah. So, and the other thing that that is a critique of Abramsky's approach. I mean, by the way, I mean the, the approach is brilliant. You know, it's like, I mean, um, you know, many people still are are rightfully in awe of of his construction. So, so, so I'm you know I'm only criticizing it because it's so good. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> It's worthy of critique. So, so the, 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 other, the other thing about it is that, that he, the domain theory is, is largely semantic as opposed to syntactic. Um, and the, the shift in the ladle approach or this construction is to be you know, predominantly syntactic since most notions of computation end up being symbolic, right? So Lisp is clearly a symbolic form of computation. Java kind of straddles straddles the fence on this, um, but you know certainly Prolog and other things they're all symbolic forms of computation, and yeah. and uh, yeah, the Pi calculus is decidedly symbolic. The row calculus is symbolic, and so so shifting over to the syntactic side is actually really important because you you are able to get a tighter connection between. Um, what you're doing and the operational semantics, right? The, the denotational semantics it erases a lot of in information that's available in the operational semantics, and, and that information is exactly what we need to reason about things like complexity. It's the same idea, and, and, and Chi Race picks it up again with the spatial behavior logic. They just didn't think to categorize it using or to, to uh, address it using category theory. Mm -hmm. Right, so the thread has been there for a long time, and it's just now, uh, you know, it, it took someone foolish enough to say, hey, I think the scope of this is much more. <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, one, one thing I wanted to say uh, to that is uh, that shift to like the syntactical uh, uh, approach uh, also lends itself to doing all of these checks at compile time. Right, because you yes. just need the code, and, and that's it. Exactly. That's that's exactly right. You're not going to some intermediate format that is right. sort of more semantic in nature. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm.